Since the beginning of TV and film, women have been the emotional support, the punching bags, the therapists for abusive men. Even as society gets more progressive and highlights social movements in mainstream media, one thing that never goes away is abusive relationships being sugarcoated and idealized. I'm going to be using examples from Twilight, Gossip Girl, Pretty Little Liars, The Vampire Diaries, and other media, so consider this your spoiler warning. Number 1. I Can Fix Him One of the most harmful effects of glorifying abuse is how it shapes the idea of what a relationship should look like to young girls and boys. According to the CDC, 25% of high school females have been abused by a partner, and the CDC aims to prevent teen dating violence with family-based programs and improving school climates. But what about easily accessible media? The Twilight Saga, for example, is one of the highest grossing film franchises in North America, making over $3.3 billion in box office. I was too young to watch it when the first installment came out in 2008, but the craze was still ongoing when I got my hands on the books and watched the movies in middle school. The books and films focus on Bella, a 17-year-old high schooler with daddy issues, and her relationship with Edward, a self-deprecating vampire who dominates their relationship. He often intimidates, stalks, and controls Bella, who is much more naive and inexperienced in comparison to a 104-year-old vampire with immensely powerful abilities. Bella's personality is made fairly bland and is generally defined by those around her. She is her father's caretaker, Edward's girlfriend, Jacob's best friend, and Renesmee's mother. Even as a vampire, her only ability is to protect others. When Edward leaves town, she is shown as being in a depressive state for months and nothing happens in her life until Edward comes back again. Basically, her entire personality is about being there for everyone else. This shows young girls that they have no value on their own, or at least none without the men in their lives. Her relationships with others also give off the notion that you should stay with your partner or friend no matter how they treat you, mostly depicted through her relationship with Edward. Like I mentioned before, he stalked and intimidated Bella even before their relationship. How did you get in here? The window. Do you do that a lot? The past couple of months. I like watching you sleep. It's kind of fascinating to me. And if that scene wasn't enough, I'm the world's most dangerous predator. Everything about me invites you in. My voice, my face, even my smell. As if you could fight me off. Designed to kill. I don't care. I've killed people before. It does not matter. I wanted to kill you. Her responses to his threats are basically no. I don't care that you're a vampire that can easily kill me. I can fix you. This shows impressionable young girls that they should stay in a relationship where they are being mistreated, or even aim for one, so they can make a bad boy good. We see this briefly in Divergent, when Four, the main male lead, purposely nicks Triss's ear in a training session to avoid further conflicts with another character, and he says, If I wanted to hurt you, I would've. This is used to establish kindness on his part for not hurting her more than the other character would have, while also asserting his dominance. Him reminding her that he goes about his day choosing not to harm her is patronizing and romanticizes the iron grip with which men hold women in abusive relationships. So am I supposed to thank you? This also occurs fairly often in Gossip Girl, such as when Chuck, the main male lead, is cruel to Blair, his on and off again girlfriend, but came to her when he needed her help. I love you. That's too bad. and also when she had to pull him out of bad situations. Please. You'll notice a similarity between Edward, Four, and Chuck. Their attitudes and manner of speaking to those around them make them classic bad boys. And the I can fix you trope usually goes hand in hand with the bad boy trope. Why don't you let people see the good in you? Because when people see good, they expect good. Number two, the bad boy. The brooding, doesn't care about anyone else but you character with the tragic backstory is one that has been around for a long time, with James Dean's work from the 1950s being a blueprint for bad boy characters to this day. This bad boy is usually in need of therapy, has anger issues, and is mean to absolutely everybody, including his love interest. Having a troubled bad boy date a good girl is what inherently leads to female characters having to fix their partners. Please! It's not a school night and I've been a good girl! Just think about films known as classics, Grease or The Breakfast Club. 
In The Breakfast Club, five students that are meant to embody five stereotypes, the princess, the nerd, the jock, the outcast, and the criminal, spend an afternoon in detention together. All of the characters open up to each other and share their trauma, but Claire, the princess, is the only one constantly patronized and mocked by John, the criminal. And you don't like me anyway. You know, I have just as many feelings as you do, and it hurts just as much when somebody steps all over them. God, you're so pathetic. Don't you ever, ever compare yourself to me, okay? You got everything, and I got shit. Okay, so go home and cry to your daddy. Don't cry here, okay? His words are forgiven because he plays the victim using his experiences of being mistreated. What do you care what I think anyway? I don't even count, right? I could disappear forever and it wouldn't make any difference. Nonetheless, they share a kiss by the end of the movie. In Greece, Sandy, a doe-eyed exchange student, is reunited with her summer fling, Danny, only to find out that he is not what he appeared to be over the summer. Sandy! Danny? What are you, what are you doing here? Well, that's cool, baby. I mean, you know how it is, rocking and rolling and whatnot. Danny? <laughs> that's my name. Don't wear it out. What's the matter with you? <laughs> What's the matter with me, baby? What's the matter with you? <laughs> what happened to the Danny Zuko I met at the beach? <laughs> well, I do not know. Danny is visibly excited to see Sandy again, but doesn't want to risk exposing his persona and treats her like she doesn't matter, hurting her feelings. By the end of the movie, she changes herself completely to align with what he wants. Tell me about it, Stern. These examples are not as extreme as Edward literally threatening to kill Bella, but the subtle messages they send to both girls and boys are just the same. When boys like you, they will be mean to you, and when they are, you should ignore it. Or like these heroines, you should accept their will over yours and let them step all over you. Similar to Edward, Danny and John have more power in their relationships with their heroines, or at least more of a voice. This power imbalance is commonly present within these idealized abusive relationships. Number three, power imbalance. As we have established by now, the bad boy always has more power within the relationship than the girl does. We usually think of a power imbalance as being caused by age or position, but it can be a variety of other qualities. In Twilight, Edward is a vampire with powers while Bella is a normal high schooler. Bella's other love interest, Jacob, was a werewolf who, by the way, was on his way to kill her daughter when he imprinted on her, a baby. You imprinted on my daughter? It wasn't my choice. She's a baby! It's not like that. Anyway. In Greece, Danny is popular while Sandy is new to the school. In The Breakfast Club, John is more harsh and outspoken, therefore making his voice more heard than Claire, who is seen as the princess with no real problems. We also see this present in Gossip Girl when Chuck trades his girlfriend for a hotel. Yep. When his uncle offers a deal, one night with Blair in exchange for ownership of a hotel, Chuck agrees secretly while pretending to be distraught in front of Blair, knowing she would offer herself up to save what he holds dear. This is top-tier manipulation. Later, he even gets angry at her for being hurt, saying, you went up there on your own. There's also a moment where he physically harms her when she tells him she is getting married to another guy. You'll never marry anyone else, you're mine. Not anymore. Mine, Blair. No. Stop it, Chuck! Then it's over. Just like in Divergent, he asserts his physical dominance over her, showing her that he can and will harm her if he ever feels the urge to do so. Another example that is rarely talked about is the relationship between Arya and Ezra from Pretty Little Liars, who dated when Arya was in high school and Ezra was her teacher. This, on its own, should be enough to tell you that our society has a problem. The creators try to pass it off by having them meet in a bar where Arya never discloses her age, so Ezra is left blameless. But they continue their relationship regardless, and it's later revealed that he knew her age from the night they met due to his past fling with another one of her classmates. This was clearly a predatory relationship, so why do they get a happy ending? Our society has a major problem with underage girls being hypersexualized and preyed on by older men, and it's just enforced by media like this. Even 11 years after the show's debut, our mindset regarding this topic hasn't changed. Just look at TikTok. Young girls are made to think that empowering themselves directly correlates to being a sexual being, which it doesn't. TikTok has also popularized the idea that creating an OnlyFans the day you turn 18 is a good idea. 
Clearly, we don't need any student-teacher relationships to add more pressure on young girls to be more mature or sexual than they are. With all of these obvious examples, how is it possible that we haven't been filled with outrage or just haven't noticed at all? Number four, pretty privilege. What all of these men have in common is, well, their face. By our standards, or our standards in the late 2000s, these men were seen as attractive. Replace either partner in the relationship with one that's less attractive, and the dynamic would immediately shift. And directors know this, casting attractive, white, 20-somethings to play these roles. If Edward hadn't been a mysterious vampire, I doubt his antics would have been taken so well by the general public. If Chuck wasn't a charismatic rich boy, him forcing himself on two girls in the very first episode wouldn't have been ignored in favor of his character development and relationship buildup with Blair. After all, when you have attractive characters that mistreat their love interests from the very beginning, you know there's nowhere for them to go but up. Similarly, in The Vampire Diaries, both vampire brothers assault many of the women in the show, but it is not acknowledged even once. Both brothers have the power to compel others to bend to their will, occasionally wiping their memory. This on its own creates a power imbalance, but even more so when they apply these powers to the high school girls they sleep with. If Damon didn't have his bad boy persona and his crooked smile, and Stefan didn't have his so-called caring attitude and piercing eyes, perhaps viewers wouldn't deny their wrongdoing so strongly. Are you gonna kill me? Mm -hmm. But the biggest example of this has to be in Suicide Squad, in the depiction of Harley Quinn's and the Joker's relationship. It was well known before the movie came out that the two had all of the issues I mentioned before, due to the large fan base of the original comics. But the movie chose not to depict any actual scenes of physical mistreatment, instead only having the Joker appear for 10 minutes in the entire movie, in which his mistreatment of Harley is made out to be more sensual and erotic rather than outright abusive. Surrender, surrender becomes power. Do you want this? Say it. Say it. Say it. Pretty, 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 pretty. In the movie, he doesn't really get a tragic backstory either, so the only introduction movie fans get is that he's crazy and kills people. This would seemingly make him less likable than he already is, but his and Harley's relationship became the main focus despite barely being present in the movie. This is completely due to Jared Leto's good looks, which made the couple an easy target for shippers and fan-made video editors. Many fans claim they want a toxic relationship like theirs, or that they never thought they would find the Joker as attractive as they do ignoring the fact that he has caused the deaths of hundreds of people and abused Harley on many occasions, treating her like a doll that he can play with and throw out when he gets tired of her. His attractiveness plays a major factor in the public's opinion of him, which often translates in our real-life perception of toxic men. How often have you seen a real-life celebrity get away with questionable actions just because of their status or looks? And how many times have we seen a woman criticized for the same actions that men get praised for? Clearly, the depictions of fictional men reflect our values and standards for men and women in real life. Number 5. Examples in 2021 You may have listened to some of my examples and been unimpressed. Most of the examples I mentioned were released over 10 years ago, and we are a lot more sensitive to such topics than we were then, right? Well, kind of. Whereas in the 2010s, a majority of shows and films featured toxic tropes, we have a lot more variety and healthy portrayals now. Think of media like Anne with an E, Lady Bird, Little Women, and so many more that focus on feminism, racism, mental health issues, homophobia, and other social movements. Despite rare shows like these that do get it right, it seems like we still haven't grown out of the toxic mindset. Twilight was trending multiple times on TikTok in both 2020 and 2021, despite being released 10 years ago. So if you thought that the general public was aware or cared of how harmful this film franchise was, think again. The movie 365 Days was also trending on TikTok for a time in 2020, with the hashtag garnering 4.3 billion views and even inspiring a challenge that garnered 42.5 million views. The movie itself is about a member of the mafia that kidnaps a woman and gives her 365 days to fall in love with him. It has a 0% rating on Rotten Tomatoes and a 3.3 out of 10 on IMBD, which shows that the movie was a major miss, excluding the specific demographic on social media that made a movie romanticizing kidnapping a trend. This is all besides the fact that both Gossip Girl and Pretty Little Liars are getting a reboot in 2021, despite how problematic the shows were the first time around. Other major examples from outside of America include Boys Over Flowers and Playful Kiss. Originally a manga released from 1992 until 2008, 
Boys Over Flowers revolves around a poor girl named Makino that goes to an elite private school run by a group of four of the richest boys there. She gets involved with them, mainly with the group's number one, Domyuji, and their relationship grows throughout the series. The catch, though, is that like all of the men in this video, Domyuji is rich, handsome, powerful, and abusive. This series has been adapted 11 times, with the most recent being a 2021 upcoming Thai version. In the most popular adaptations, Domyuji is at best verbally abrasive, and at worst is responsible for an attempted sexual assault on his future girlfriend. And yet, this series is regarded as a classic in East and South Asia. Similarly, Playful Kiss was a manga first released in 1990, getting 12 adaptations with the most recent being released in 2019. The premise is similar, a less fortunate girl falls for a rich and handsome guy, creating a major power imbalance in their already toxic relationship. Combined, that is 23 adaptation with millions of adolescents and young adults watching abusive relationships romanticized over and over again for 30 years. The Korean drama of Playful Kiss had 7 million viewers alone. Clearly this isn't an American-based issue, but more so an issue with how media chooses to portray relationships between men and women. Isn't it time we start seeing healthy and positive depictions of heterosexual relationships, without tropes that put women at a disadvantage? And that's it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like and let me know what you think in the comments.